Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, I'd like to welcome you, dear viewers, to another in our series, The Forces of Evil. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah's peace and blessings be on each and every one of you. This program, this episode, is a part of a series in which we're looking at how the satanic forces uh, wage war against humans. We've looked at uh, some of the major areas, the areas of doubts and the areas of beautification of desires and sins in our previous episodes. And in this uh, segment, we'll be looking at the discouragement from righteousness. You know, how the satanic forces uh, cause people who do believe in God, do want to do the right thing, but their worship is deviated or uh, sent astray by uh, them being discouraged from doing certain righteous acts that they should do. Now, first and foremost, we find there is uh, encouragement or, or, or an effort to get people to give up worship altogether. You know, the abandonment of worship. This is, of course, a, a major uh, area in which the satanic forces has affected our world and can affect our world and continue to affect our world. Uh, where people abandon prayer for a variety of different reasons. Whether it be because of calamities in their lives which they can't seem to find explanations for. Or it be because of laziness. You know, things, they get involved with other things and they feel lazy, you know. Uh, they stay up late at night or whatever, or they be, you know. So through laziness they may abandon the prayers or it may be through uh, being very uh, attached to some other practices. You know, people get, for example, caught up in sports and things like this and uh, they end up abandoning prayers because of the sports, you know, because of their professions. Or it may be because of material things. People uh, want to get, uh, you know, certain uh, wealth, gather this wealth around them too buy a house and a car and look after family, etc. These type of things. Uh, maybe in their job situation, there's no opportunity for prayer and um, they don't want to try to take, tackle this problem. Uh, they wouldn't consider giving up this job and seeking another job. So they'll sacrifice their prayers in these kind of circumstances. Now of course, these are very uh, dangerous uh, circumstances where a person abandons prayer and it becomes after that a way of life with him or her that they no longer pray. This is a very dangerous state to enter into because once a person falls into that really what they have done is they've broken their link with Allah. This is their spiritual link. This is the source by which their spirit is fed. Primary source. The source of prayer. So once this link is broken then they become exposed, you know, other areas of corruption can easily creep up on them. So it's a very, very important link. This is why it's the first pillar of practice in Islam. When a person declares their faith, the first thing that is required of them is to establish the prayer. So to get them to abandon prayers, uh, this is the beginning of the end. It may begin with a voluntary prayers that we do. And when a person gives those up, no longer does them, and all that remains is the compulsory prayers, eventually satanic forces try to, you know, to, to work away and chip away at even this foundation. And this is why we have voluntary acts of worship around all of our compulsory acts of worship. Whether it be the daily prayers, or it would be the fasting in Ramadan, or it be the compulsory charity, or it be the pilgrimage. All of these primary acts of worship have along with them voluntary acts of worship which surround them that we are encouraged to do to protect those primary acts. For example, in our daily prayers, you know, before the morning prayer, there are two units of voluntary prayers that are recommended. You know, and um, after our midday prayers, they're not only voluntary prayers before 
but also voluntary prayers after. And um, these are explained to, to serve as a means of protecting that compulsory prayer. On one hand, what it does is it prepares the person spiritually to go into the compulsory prayer, that we don't just stop whatever we're doing, we go straight into compulsory prayer, where our minds may still be caught up in whatever we're involved in, whether it's work, family related, or whatever. Our minds are still there, we enter the prayer, our minds are still outside of the prayer. So there are voluntary prayers there to help get us more focused on it. Also when we come into the mosque, for example, it's required that we pray two units of prayer before we sit down. The person comes and sits in the mosque, somebody else comes and sits beside them, they're all friends, they start chatting about things which have no relationship to do with worshiping God, etc. Then the final call for prayer, the Ikhama is given, they get up to pray and they're still thinking about their conversation. So what we're enjoined to do whenever we come in is to make two units of prayer before sitting down. To put ourselves in the correct frame of mind. And then after the compulsory prayer there are also voluntary prayers which are encouraged to do and these make up for deficiencies in our compulsory prayer. In fact the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had informed us that when God asks us about the compulsory prayers, you'll ask the angels, you know, about our record of compulsory prayers. After getting that information, then he'll ask about the voluntary prayers, and they will be used as a means to complete deficiencies which are in our compulsory acts of worship. This is a standard. Now, as I said, these voluntary prayers form a kind of a shield around that compulsory prayer, so that a person in the times of weakness, when their faith is low and people's faith decrease and increase. This is a norm. Everybody's, nobody's faith just stays high the whole time. No, there's an increase and decrease constant. So what happens is that the satanic forces may come at us in the time when the faith is down and may cause us to abandon prayer. But what prayer do we abandon? If we have this uh, fortress around our compulsory prayer, we'll abandon the, comp the voluntary prayers and our compulsory prayers will still be intact. But if we only are praying compulsory prayers and we leave out the voluntary prayers, then when we are attacked by these forces in times of weaknesses, then we end up abandoning, abandoning the compulsory prayers themselves. So, uh, satanic forces may come at us in a variety of different ways. The Prayers are the, the, the primary area, the, the area which if that link is broken, the person is already on the path to hell. Prophet Muhammad had said the distinction between the believers and the disbelievers is salah, the five times daily prayer. Whoever abandons it has become a disbeliever. It is so critical, it is so you know, important in the life of the Muslim that they establish their five times daily prayer. And that is on time, properly, in the proper format, proper concentration, etc. This is a key to success in both this life and the next. So the satanic forces try to attack that. And we talked about the ways in which doubts are created to make that prayer even more difficult for the individual, etc. But first and foremost, there is this discouragement from worship. It might even come where one sees non-Muslims successful, not praying. They're not involved in prayer and they've achieved success. One starts to doubt, well, well, what's the value of this prayer? Satanic forces put these thoughts in their mind. You know, or it may come from some friend around you, a so-called friend. You know, what's the use of the prayers? It's not helping you out. You're not a successful businessman, etc., etc. Well, the bottom line is that prayer is not specifically to provide for the individual success in this life. It is for success in the next life that one has the correct frame of mind to deal with the trials and calamities of this life, to patiently bear the difficulties, to find contentment in this life, and ultimately to achieve ultimate success in the next life. So, uh, material success oftentimes doesn't have with it any contentment. People are very successful, they have all the riches in the world, but their lives, they, they're, they're hollow, they have missing links there and you find people with all this wealth etc get involved in all kinds of corruption some of them kill themselves all these kind of things happen to them why 
because material wealth really ultimately will not bring us true happiness. So, the first area of discouragement from righteousness is the actual discouragement from the prayer itself. The second area is by encouraging the introduction of some innovation or bidah. This is one of the ways that the satanic forces operates. Because, as it has been said, whenever an innovation enters into the religion, one of its sunnah practices or practices of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessed be upon him, is removed. When an innovation comes in, a practice of the Prophet is lost. This is the relationship. It's like a cup. You pour water in it. It can only occupy so much space. The more you pour in of another substance, the less you have of what was originally in there. So, this is one of the modes by which people are discouraged from proper worship. Innovations are introduced, where people begin to, for example, you know, make pilgrimages to graves, uh, to depend on other intermediaries, to worship in ways which were not prescribed by Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, to try and find shortcuts to paradise, this is a lot of times spiritual shortcuts are offered. And with these innovative ways, people become very attached to them because they're very pleasing to their desires. You know, they're easier, they're, they're fun, you know, or whatever. Whereas the regular drudgery of regular worship, etc., etc., you know, this is looked at as being something, you know, mundane, there's no real benefit in it, you know, etc. The real benefit is, is in these things which, which make our spirit alive. So music may become very attractive, you know, so-called religious songs which are filled with all kinds of musical instruments, which are actually forbidden in Islam, but which, where a person is, is not aware of innovation and the issues of innovation, may become very attractive to them. You know, and they may feel very much that they're in touch with God through these uh, various means. Another way in which uh, righteousness uh, is discouraged is that major sins are encouraged. Major sins, whether they be adultery, whether they be shirk, or whether they be involve, you know, fortune telling, or in all of the major sins for which uh, the Prophet ﷺ had prescribed hell as the ultimate end, where these sins are encouraged in place of righteousness. You know, people are discouraged from righteousness by the promotion of these major sins. And of course, we sp spoke about that at length previously, how uh, adultery and fornication, taking drugs and you know, all these kind of things have become very much uh, attractive to us in the media. The media pumping these things up Everything that is sold is sold with, you know, this heavy sexual overtones, a man and a woman, the woman, you know, uh, attracted to the man, the man attracted to the woman, in order to sell different products, etc. You know, uh, th this is a means also of encouraging people towards adultery and fornication in the society. You know, products should be sold according to their merit. You know, what does it have? How good is it? Etc. Not you know, with these visual images which give the impression that uh, you'll get this or you'll get that of sexual favors if one uh, takes these particular substances. Uh, if this fails, then the satanic force forces will try to introduce minor sins. If the major sins can't be uh, gotten at or get the individual can't be tricked into or are drawn into these major sins, then they will be drawn into minor sins. You know, minor sins which we tend to look at as, oh, it's not so bad, it's, you know, it's minor, etc. But the Prophet ﷺ warned us. He said, Iyakum wa muhakkarat al zanub Beware of the minor sins which you consider to be insignificant. Right? The scorned sins. They're so small. 
you know, people are involved in, you know, tend to people, people look at the other people and say, well, they're involved in such big sins, look what they're doing here, this corruption, so on, so on. What I'm doing is very small. But the point is, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, beware of these minor sins because they are like an individual who collects sticks in a valley. You know, he wants to make a fire. One stick will not make the bonfire for him to cook on. So he goes and collects sticks from all over the valley, puts them together, then he can make a huge bonfire to cook whatever he planned to cook. But these simple sins are like them. That they, what, what we consider to be insignificant may be very, very significant in that it, it links up with other insignificant or minor sins of ours and then becomes a major uh, setback for ourselves, possibly even drawing us into hell. The other uh, way in which uh, people may be discouraged from righteousness is an issue of priorities, where if we cannot be drawn into minor sins or innovation uh, or major sins, then it becomes one of promoting what is good over what is better, you know. So we're encouraged to, to, uh, to do things which are, they're good in and of themselves, but we're doing them in the wrong place in the wrong time. And in doing them, we end up abandoning some other righteous deed, which is very important. That where a person thinks they're doing good, but in the end, actually what they're doing is wrong because the, the priorities have been turned upside down. So for example, a person, you know, may, uh, it may be time for prayer and um, they see an opportunity to do a charitable act. So uh, the, the idea comes to them, well let me go and finish off the charitable act so and so and so, even though I may miss the prayer because, you know, this charitable act is very good, the people need this money or they need so and so and so. So we have rationalized something to do, go and do this good thing, but on the other hand, what we've done is we've abandoned something which is even greater, something more obligatory on us. It's a dangerous way in which the satanic forces can cause us to abandon righteousness, you know. Um, another way is also to put fear in our hearts and confusion, to discourage, for example, discourage charity, where Allah said in the Quran, الشيطان يعدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء. Satan of puts fear in your hearts of of poverty and commands you to corruption. He puts fear in your heart of poverty. Meaning that if you do a charitable act, you're going to have less. Your money is going to be less. Maybe you're going to need it next year or the year after. Maybe it's better not to give it. You know, different excuses are given to yourself to avoid doing this thing. Whereas, really what you should do, you have this thing what somebody needs, you should just go ahead and give it. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that charity does not decrease wealth. It may appear to. Externally, it appears to decrease. We had $100, we gave away 50 we now have 50 There's less. However, that 100 which we have been given becomes thousands of good deeds for us on the Day of Judgment. It's been increased in value. And the remaining wealth is also blessed. So, so charity does not decrease wealth. But satanic forces, when a person thinks to be charitable, will come to them and make all these other suggestions to discourage them from doing charitable deeds. So, this is among, these are, these that I've mentioned are among some of the many different ways in which the satanic forces uh, discourage us from righteousness. Whether they get us to abandon prayers or to introduce innovations, to think that minor sins are not important, or to put things in the wrong priority and also to create confusion and doubts amongst ourselves. With that, dear viewers, we'd like to thank you for being with us in this segment of our program, The Forces of Evil. I'm your host, Dr. Bilal Phillips. 
If you'd like to contact me for further suggestions or questions on this program, you can contact me at Sharjah Television, P.O. Box 111, Sharjah, UAE. Or you may contact me on the email at bilalphillips.com, B-I-L-A-L-P-H-I-L-I-P-S dot com. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.